there, there's nothing about this memorial that tells you what to think. It doesn't, it doesn't instruct you. It allows you it, to, to open your mind if you're willing, which is one of the reasons why it's so rich and so powerful. This was not necessarily a memorial that was supposed to glorify the war, but had that much more one person at a time to heal them. It doesn't matter the age, the time period, whether or not someone's a veteran or not, to be uh, moved by the 59,000 names that are placed on that wall and the way that they're placed. The chronological order really points to the scale and magnitude of the disaster and calls question to war in general and why we engage in these horrific activities. The way veterans were treated was uh, the reason we built the memorial. There was indifference, disdain, uh, contempt. Uh, there was this idea that you were either stupid or a loser or you were too dumb to uh, get out of it. Uh, there was anything but honor and recognition. Vietnam was the first televised war. And if you'll stop to think, when it happened in Vietnam, the people back here in the States were watching our men die five to six hours later on your local nightly news. It was the first time Americans saw the war in their living rooms. And some people try to dismiss the impact that had. But I think that's crazy. Uh, in the same way you uh, put your product into a movie so people will see it and remember it and you pay a lot of money for that, uh, you're going to tell me that this war in your living room had no impact? It was all on TV. I mean, they're showing these people, maybe not getting blown up, but they're showing bringing our boys home in body bags. The constant repetition of uh, soldiers suffering and fighting, refugees uh, think of Iraq and Afghanistan, but with a daily intensity of some American soldiers somewhere uh, being in a difficult situation. I just know that what I saw on television was not pleasant, and uh, as a small child, we want to have the opportunity to be children. And uh, uh, that, that war and what we saw on TV in those conflicts took away a little bit of that innocence. Some of the media that I saw, Time Magazine for instance, was way off base. And those people weren't out where I was. Even though they reported on it at least once, they weren't there. Uh, other media, that I saw, uh, what I saw, was fairly honest. And um, unfortunately, honest was not what people wanted to see or not what people wanted at the time. And as a televised war, it just showed a lot of the mistakes. The war helped to, uh, help public opinion to grow. I think the public opinion started ahead of the TV scenes. 
but the, the television reinforced, what are we doing there? How can we do this to our young men? Uh, although, um, unfortunately, Vietnam veterans were uh, sorely mistreated when they came home in many cases. Unlike the World War II homecoming, the Vietnam War was a conflict where we didn't come home to a ticker tape parade or a particular day everything was resolved and people were bending folks over in Times Square and kissing and, and waving their sailor hats. That uh, that kind of event did not take place. In my early years, they seemed to be, you know, kind of these mini heroes that were, you know, sprinkled around the world. And by the time I was in high school, they seemed not to be heroes any longer. And I just didn't think that was fair. Oh, Vietnam veterans, uh, it was terrible. It didn't happen to every veteran, but there were, in extremes, people who would shout at them, baby killers. Uh, you would go, they would try to go to college and all the students in the college classes would put them down or worse? Well, uh, here in town in South Bend, uh, it wasn't all that bad. I mean, I came home, I, you know, I, I was okay with that, but when we landed in San Francisco, <clears throat> there was a lot of people protesting us. Uh, we would go outside and they would actually uh, call us names and they had their place cards and all that stuff. But they would actually uh, spit, not towards us, they would spit off to the side but look at us, but they didn't have the guts to come up and even talk to us. <laughs> they knew better. He got home uh, right after I got out of, this, out of the Navy. And he went from jungle to living room in less than four days. So, I mean, he was nervous and skittish and he didn't sleep much and he didn't talk much. And he was like, you know, until he got used to being uh, out of the jungle and out of combat. Uh, unlike the sailors like in, uh, in the Marine guys in World War II, uh, they came home on ships. It took them two weeks or better to get home, and sometimes a month, where they had this time to decompress. The Vietnam guys didn't have that. They took them out of the jungle, put them on a helicopter, took them to the air base. Three days later. Yeah, the portrayal of the American soldier obviously was, um, yeah, not, not good. And we felt that even over there, because we, we, we got the feedback, and it's like, um, um, I think we learned to believe it to some degree. I don't think we did, I know we did, even still. When I first came back from Vietnam, I got out of the off plane and everything in California and went through the checkout, the whole nine yards of getting out of the, getting out of the area. When I left the uh, Oakland Army Air Terminal, stepped outside the gate, and the first thing that happened, I got in a fight with four hippies. Called me baby killer and all this crap. Well, it's a good thing there was a police officer standing there when he did, because he even, he arrested all four of them, and he told me, he said, it's a good thing this man didn't get a hold of all of you, he said, because he would have killed every one of you. I mean, that was 18 hours after I'd left the foxhole. Actually, my experience in my hometown, the irony of it is that, um, I was, uh, I was a bad person when I was in the service because in Vietnam I fell in love with the Vietnamese who had two children. I went back six months later as a civilian and um, I don't remember whether I got married the first year or not. Anyway, I didn't get all the paperwork done so the next year I went back again and finally got all the paperwork done and brought my wife and two children back over. and. Um, I grew up in a small town not far from here, and I thought that's a good place to raise a family. And um, I got a teaching job there and basically got booed out of town.
friends that I went to high school with, friends that I went to school with, told me to get those effing gooks out of town. So um, after about a year, I moved back to Muncie because Muncie's more liberal. Well, I'm younger than the veterans of that, of that era. But when I was in high school, I remember that there was a very clear direction from the Joint Chiefs of Staff that people in military service should no longer wear their uniforms when they were traveling. That they were, frankly, required not to wear their uniforms. And these uh, folks in military service were kind of considered tools, uh, thoughtless beings doing what they were told and they shouldn't have been doing that. They should have been resisting somehow. So in any case, they had to kind of go undercover and. And, and to generalize them was not fair, and, and to treat them poorly and cause them to kind of go into hiding was wrong. So, so that's really what I remember. Well, Vietnam, most people, uh, most of the news, uh, everybody, this is the only war we have ever lost. And as I said before, we didn't lose it on the battlefield, we lost it in the halls of Congress. And because they decided to stop at the 17th parallel instead of going all the way up and doing the job that we were trained to do, they wouldn't let us do our job. So therefore, a lot of our boys came home and they thought we had disgraced our country. And that's not true. If you stop to think, one of the reasons most veterans come home and are sane and productive human beings is because they feel as if they did something for their country. And here were young men coming home where people were saying, uh, you're, a you're terrible for having been in this war and killing innocent people in another country. Uh, instead of saying, thank you so much for helping to keep us free and, uh, and alive. I returned from Vietnam and uh, eventually got myself uh, an education and became very interested in, uh, in psychology. And I think in part it may have been due to some of my own experiences and my own sort of uh, difficulties in readjusting from the war. But ultimately I became an expert on post-traumatic stress disorder, published articles, testified in front of the Senate after graduate school. and. Uh, that sort of led to the idea of a memorial as something tangible that would help the veterans to uh, feel a little better about their service. Jan Scruggs and I happened to meet by accident. We both attended a meeting in April of 1979 that was called to see if we could put on some kind of a local observance for an event called Vietnam Veterans Week that the Congress had declared. And we thought, you know, the purpose of the meeting was to see if we could get some publicity that would actually focus on the needs of veterans. And at the meeting, Jan stood up and he said, what about a memorial? And uh, surprisingly, most people at the meeting put him down. They said, we don't need a memorial. But it resonated with me because Frankly, I didn't need any more benefits, and I thought really what people needed was recognition, like he was proposing. Basically, the idea for the, the memorial came about when I was doing my graduate, my graduate work. But we, I did see, see the movie The Deer Hunter, and, and after seeing that movie, I did decide to actually do this myself, and became convinced that I could do this myself. But in fact, I couldn't. And uh, we got a lot of, it became the effort of a lot of, of, of hands, and, and I get all the credit for it. 
I got into the project because frankly Jan uh, retained me as a lawyer to um, incorporate the nonprofit corporation and it was sort of a halfway deal. I, half my time was paid and half my time I volunteered to do that work. And uh, he asked me to be, it took three directors to set up a nonprofit corporation and he asked me to be one of them. And uh, frankly, he was a you know, sincere uh, man and uh, I felt it was a, uh, it was a noble project and uh, I was willing to help. Uh, it took a while, of course, for me, my personal circumstances to allow me to even devote more time to it, but uh, that was the genesis. You know, I was kind of more of the front guy. And uh, so the same, same thing now. You know, I have other people doing the, the, the work requiring a great deal of intelligence. I just sort of explain the mission. To be uh, honest with you, uh, to work with Jan Scruggs for me was there was uh, there was a lot of tension between Jan and me because uh, my style is much more uh, deliberative and uh, methodical, and his style is much more to uh, I might even say to uh, shoot from the hip and say what's on his mind. We had to have all the names from that war together at the same place to make this work. So this was my, I may ever, never do anything else right in my life, but I knew this was gonna work. Therapeutic landscapes, which have been discussed quite a bit in the last 10 or 15 years, was not something that was talked about then. The idea of a place healing, at least in thinking about public landscapes, was not an idea that was out there. This, this, this had to be done. This, the, the central element of the, of the design would have to be the names because that was my whole theory, was that by seeing these names, this would help the veterans to heal. It uh, is a very graphic depiction of the price that uh, our country paid in, uh, in Vietnam. And of course, uh, without a lot of uh, questioning, they probably realize that most of the names on the wall are those of 19-year-old uh, men, and uh, which is not far from their own age. And so it gives uh, a very, very uh, uh, sober reminder of the uh, costs of citizenship and, and uh, you know, what, uh, what sacrifices uh, people have to make. It was my idea to have a competition because I felt from the beginning, I mean, we were getting all kinds of inquiries from people who said, you know, holding up their hands saying, choose me, choose me, choose me. And it was, uh, you know, an impossible task without some sort of a, uh, some sort of organized process. And, uh, you know, I felt maybe there's somebody out there in this world that was born to design this. And we made it, anyone 18, any American citizen over 18 years of age, old enough to sign a contract. There were two words that guided the design competition for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which at the time was the largest held in the history, actually, of Western civilization. <laughs> with 1,421 uh, entrants in the competition. But it was that this memorial shall be reflective and contemplative and harmonious. Uh, there will be a landscape solution to this. So whatever it was would be selected would need to be sort of nicely landscaped, not, you know, big. It could be big, but it just had to sort of fit there.
One of the things that's always astonished me is how this project got chosen out of over 1,400 entries. I'm constantly amazed at how that was possible. And of all the participants in the competition, her, hers probably most clearly met that. Didn't bother me at all that it was uh, that was she was so young and that she was a student. I mean, the whole idea of the competition was to come up with a concept that could be developed and refined. In a very brilliant way, you know, the names are not alphabetical and they are chronological. But if you were on a, in a battle on May 1st, 1968, the names of the casualties who did not survive that battle are right next to each other. So uh, uh, this allows you to really go back in time and, uh, and by sort of confronting this event. Her design, her drawings, and her presentation was actually fairly weak. I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard that she received a C on the project, the studio. I don't know if that's, if that's true, but it would be amazing if that's the case. It's kind of like the high school coach that cut Michael Jordan. You know. That kind of rift in the earth that she talks about, I thought that was so powerful, that idea of a rift in the earth and that sense of violence, of kind of a pushing down, that sheer action um, that compressed and, and pressed the earth like that and essentially tore it with the idea that the granite was the facing, was the memory of that violence, you know, but still and quiet. I would probably say at the beginning, um, my, I, was, I was bewildered by it because for one thing, I could not myself perceive the uh, beauty of it with the polished black granite and how the place itself is such a magical place when you're actually there on the spot. And uh, at the beginning, reading her statement where she focused on the dead, I actually said to the jury, I think you've made a mistake because we wanted a memorial to all who served and you've chosen a memorial to the dead. I think Maya Lynn was, was very fortunate um, she was able to articulate a, a vision, and as the documentary, A Strong, Clear Vision, suggests, that's really what it, it's about, coming up with a strong conceptual statement. Many people talked about how dreamy those drawings were, but if you read then her statement, it was completely precise, it was completely rigorous, totally clear, and just every bit as imaginative as the drawings appeared. They were that precise. From the beginning, I admired her tenacity and maturity because she uh, had many strong ideas about how she wanted her design to be developed and who she wanted to be on the team. And I found her very assertive and, uh, and uh, so, uh, she was a force to be reckoned with. It was very difficult, I know, for her. She was in D.C. alone. She was 22. All of a sudden you go from being a student to being, um, having the architecture critic for the Washington Post calling you up and Time Magazine calling you up. There was um, written into the competition documents the requirement that if the person who won did not have the professional skills to develop and see the memorial through uh, completion, that they would affiliate with an architectural firm. And we at Cooper Lackey, we were one of the firms that was interviewed. One of the things that I did as project manager was to work with our specifications person on the standards that 
certain materials had to meet that were going to be used in the project. The essence of the design was to have a highly reflected black granite. And that meant the grain had to be very fine. And uh, it turns out that there are only three places in the world their granite is mined that has that fine a grain. For example, in North America, the black granites are very mottled. They have large white chunks. They would not have been suitable. And so the three places in the world were Sweden, India, and South Africa. There is a Swedish black that has um, too much mica in it, too much um, kind of light flex um, so that inscribing the names, you know, it might be hard to read them because of that slightly dappled surface. Um, there was a South African black that was so black, it almost didn't look like stone. It was so perfect. But at that time, for political reasons, I was not going to touch the notion of getting stone from South Africa with the apartheid system still, uh, still in place there. And then uh, India was somewhat of a new uh, supplier. The Indian black was wonderful for our purposes. There was one panel that I think we ended up rejecting but that was one among many. It was 70 panels on each wall, so 140. The idea or the notion of the inscription of the names was a major elephant in our living room because, frankly, we didn't have a clue how we were going to do this. We talked early on in the project with a stone carver who estimated that it would take every available craftsman in the world uh, three years and cost $10 million to inscribe all those names by hand. And that was the uh, designer's original idea. We realized there would have to be some sort of a sandblasting process. But that led, of course, to having to create the stencil. And then, of course, you know, the, the question there was the so many opportunities for error in creating a stencil and spelling all those names. And uh, this, this was unresolved until, out of the blue, I got a phone call in August of 1981 from a man in Cleveland, a young man, who sounded somewhat hesitant, but he said, I think I've invented a process that will help you inscribe all those names. And uh, I asked him, well, what is it? And he said, well, it's a photo, I've created a photosensitive emulsion that can be pasted on the surface of a stone, or could paint it on the surface of a stone, and actually create a stencil through a photographic means. And I sent him a piece of granite and a design, I forget what it was, and it came back a few days later perfectly inscribed. I did it again. He came back perfectly inscribed. I said, let's invest the money and bring this uh, young man to Washington. And he demonstrated to us his, his process with a chemical that coated the stone and uh, it was, uh, how could I say, until it was exposed to light, it was still water soluble. After it was exposed to light, it was no longer water soluble. So the idea was to coat the stone and then every place there was a letter in black would be, uh, the emulsion under the letter would still be water soluble. So you would have an instant stencil. The original design was, was described by Maya very simply with a couple of pastel renderings and they were so abstract, you could kind of make them anything you wanted them to be in your mind. When we built the model at Cooper Lecky, it was possible to begin to understand a little better what a, what a real experience of that might have been like. This was before computer models existed, there was no virtual reality, it was not possible to kind of immerse yourself in a digital version of anything. 
or at least not that I knew of. So, um, so we were left with our imaginations. Putting together the names, which came Department of Defense tapes, and then getting those digitized, which in 1981 um, wasn't a common thing. But then to digitize that, and from that to develop something that you could use to transfer it to stone, could sandblast the stone, all of that was a, were processes that had not been linked up before. I, was, I learned a lot during the process that was used to take Maya's concept and realize it, where realize really means make real. Um, there was a summer where I spent the entire time just working with the artwork. The, the list of five names that, that didn't have a, a database management system smart enough to recognize when you ran over the width of the panel. So we were rearranging names and, and reading them, doing a little bit of spell checking, but names are hard to spell check. So in any case, you know, we, we did what we, we could. And I, I spent a whole summer doing this. And, and I remember that summer thinking, Okay, I don't know how much of this reading death I can do, you know, every day, all day long, five days a week. And I remember thinking about, you know, not finishing the summer doing that, you know, doing something else, get a different job, try something else. But I knew that, that the memorial was meaningful and I, and I felt like it was important that someone do it. And, and I felt like I was the kind of person that was disciplined enough that I could. So I stuck with it. So most of the way up the East Wall, my name appears. It's the name of a fellow in Chicago who would be five years older than me. And that was an unsettling reflection in the wall. Okay, I did take that day off. We, of course, our job was to build a memorial. And Maya was very pure in her stance toward her design. While we were working on figuring out how to build it, the people at the VVMF had to figure out how to negotiate the political waters of DC, which I think was a much harder task, but still managing to keep that concept intact. But ultimately, uh, this became a little bit more than a, a dispute with a couple of newspaper articles. This became a dispute involving the entire United States Congress and the Secretary of the Interior refusing to give us a construction permit. So we had to make a, a deal. Regarding the integrity of Maya Lin's design, there, I fought to preserve that integrity throughout the entire process until we were given a flat-out ultimatum by the Secretary of the Interior that he would kill the project unless we compromised with the opponents. And that led to the idea that we would add a statue to the site. I mean, let's face it, this is a very unconventional memorial. So what do they want? They want a conventional memorial. So why don't we have a conventional memorial that would be attached to the unconventional memorial. And of course our opponents saw the statue as a way to spite the wall, to make the wall is only into a backdrop for the statue and a base for the flagpole. And uh, we were able to various reasonable methods to focus the flag and statue in the entry plaza and make sure that the, the uh, the original concept of the walls remained intact. But the statue that's next to the memorial itself with the flag, uh, that was kind of a political peace offering. That was kind of an, okay, we'll have something old and traditional uh, that shows the troops. And it, it works, it works fine. Uh, and it, I think it's important for it to be there, but that's not what commands the attention. What commands the attention uh, is the vision of this one young architectural student uh, who created something 
that I believe has been an important part of the healing process. Oftentimes when we do something very progressive in society, um, the reaction is to go in the other direction. And I believe that the World War II Memorial is a clear demonstration of that. Prior to the Myelin's design of the memorial, um, I think that memorial design was driven more by patriotism and uh, it was used as a vehicle to tell us how to think. I think that's what makes the Vietnam Memorial special. It is designed to encourage you to reflect as opposed to using some kind of oversized device or some larger than life statue or some flag or, or, um, or eagle or something to evoke and, and tell me how I'm supposed to think. And that's why it was so controversial. If it, if it became just a background element to the statue, then, then it would be kind of forgotten. It would be overlooked. And, and that would have been a shame. Not everybody gets abstract art. And not all abstract art is something that people can, can find meaningful. So the inclusion of the statue, I th the three servicemen statue as the first gesture, I think actually kind of humanized the experience for people, where if, if they might have been able to walk by the wall, not recognizing that the names re represented people, then the meaning of the memorial would have been significantly diminished or lost. In, instead, there's at least a statue that says, no, these aren't just lists of words or symbols. These actually represent real people. There's the issue of the memorial being a V-shape. And uh, in 2020 hindsight, I felt that we really missed the boat on the public relations aspect because even the prestigious uh, uh, architecture critics who liked the design would say that the walls met in a V-shape. And again, but the walls met at 130 degree angle, 135 degree angle, which is like that. And so it's not a V. There's no font with a V that wide. And it mostly should be noted, called a chevron shape. Had we, from the beginning, emphasized the word chevron, we could have also made the connection with uh, military rank insignia for a private or a private first class, which is a single chevron. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, it is what it is, but the problem is perception in the public mind is a very determining factor. And I wish we could have gotten rid of this idea that it was shaped like a V, because by coincidence, I mean, what could have been worse? It was the Vietnam War. We were talking about veterans. And in some cases, V was in World War II was for victory. And then during the Vietnam War, people were holding this up as the peace sign. So we had congressmen telling us that you've created the peace sign. And uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was difficult to uh, counter. And a lot of people were, wanted to change it from black to white to raise it up out of the ground as opposed to it ascending into the earth. Some people saw it as a boomerang, suggested that what we throw out there comes back to us. Some people saw it as a black scar on the earth. My feeling was that the people who didn't like the memorial didn't understand it. That they, they couldn't imagine what it would become. And, and so when, when Maya had described it as a rift in the earth, which was a, you know, a very poetic and uh, strong image of something as elemental as the earth, opening up as if you know, crying out, and then the names would be revealed as if this was the earth telling us this. I thought that was extremely poetic and rich and would be a beautiful experience. The people who didn't understand the memorial, or didn't like it if they did, called it a gash as opposed to a rift. And this whole notion of the black gash of shame was ridiculous. So you have the three soldiers. Then several years later came the, sec the, 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 the women's memorial, a much more dramatic, you know, the women holding the young soldier, looking at the helicopter. Those additions 
sort of create a trifecta. And um, it links everything together. They added a flagpole, they added um, an honor roll. Um, it, and the additions I don't think distract from Myelin's original concept. They, uh, some would say that they don't enhance. I think they enhance um, because it satisfies everyone's need to have a sort of the, the Iwo Jima type thing and the three soldiers and the women's memorial. Plus you have this fabulous landscape, which sits very in the nice little undulating grassland right there and you have this beautiful granite wall. It's pretty evocative. I had a heavy involvement with Vietnam veterans. My wife calls it my survivor's guilt, but I, I really felt uh, a part of these guys. And in Washington, when the Vietnam Memorial was being uh, discussed and debated, there were a lot of Vietnam vets when they heard what the wall was going to be, that this young woman, a college student in, at Yale, had, uh, had done the design. Uh, they, were, they thought it was going to be something that would put down their service in Vietnam. And so there was a lot of uh, unhappiness by Vietnam vets until you saw it. I went to the Vietnam Memorial in uh, D.C. and uh, it was, when I first got out there I thought I hate this thing, uh, here we go, it's a black hole in the ground. I didn't even want to go. My wife kept agging me on, agging me on, said she thought it would be the best for me, so we finally went, well, we got out there, I still didn't want to see it. I got clear up beside it. And just as soon as I walked around the end of that thing, I mean, it reached out and grabbed me like a, like a brother reached out and grabbed you. And I stayed right there with it. We stayed there for, I don't remember how many hours, left and turned around and come back again. <laughs> and we was back there three times that day. And it, uh, when you see the reflection of it, and you see yourself in that, it puts you right in it. I can remember when I was there, when we were there, going back at one o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, it was like a magnet. It was, it was amazing. There was just an attraction to that memorial. There was anything, unlike anything that we had seen before. Oh, it was a moving experience, it really was. At that time, there was a controversy going on. You know, there was a lot of, a lot of people saying that they didn't like it because it looked like a big gash in the ground. And, and uh, well, I could, I suppose, I could see their point away, but, but I think a lot of, the, I think a lot of minds has been changed now, because it's, uh, it, it's, you go down there to, I went, I went back one more time a year later, with, uh, with my mother and an aunt and an uncle, and, uh, and, uh, it still had the same, same feeling. I know the first time I saw it, it was, it was extraordinary. I, I broke down. Uh, there were names there of people, soldiers that I knew. Uh, that I had been with in Vietnam and you can go and you can trace and find the bodies on that beautiful uh, granite that is polished. It's, uh, it's an extraordinary experience, maybe because of my own Vietnam experience, but I can't go near that memorial uh, without choking up. And yet it's not a put down. Uh, it's the furthest thing from it. My first visit to the wall was really an immensely emotional experience, and emotions were not something that I was really used to feeling at the time. But it was very, very, it, it was just like this pall of sadness that just, I mean, it was such a sobering place so quickly. And I did leave. Uh, I, I was there for the, um, the first time I was there was probably 93 or 94, and I was there for the uh, women's memorial that's close by. And so the dedication of the women's memorial, but I went to the, uh, I went to the Vietnam Wall, and it was just, it was overpowering at first. And I didn't even try and find anybody's name. I have, I have 
six people on the wall from my high school class of 139 people. Uh, and I have over 30 people from my OCS class. And I found a lot of those names, uh, etched a few of them, taken a piece of paper and etched a few of them, and left flowers there a couple of times. But um, first time was just, the first time was immensely, I don't know, immensely sad. I mean, it's just like, just like dropping down into a, into a grave. And people leave all these things at the memorial. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary. I think it has an impact on people unlike any other memorial I know of. I would think that of the large memorials, this memorial is the first one that has experienced the phenomena of people leaving things. Um, memories, memorabilia, whatever you want to call them. Um, people have been leaving things from virtually the, op the, the creation of the memorial. I am the person responsible for the museum objects here at the Museum Resource Center here in Landover, Maryland. And um, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Collection is one of the collections for which I'm responsible. This entire facility was uh, created just to store all of the objects that are not currently on display in the museums around in the National Capital Region. Um, our job specifically is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Collection. And on our side with the collection itself, um, it's the rangers who collect the objects that are left at the memorial every night. And every so often uh, they'll get a big enough shipment that they bring them out here and then Janet and I are the ones who receive them and catalog them and work on them along with the staff of interns and our curator, Derry Felton. You probably remember seeing the roadside memorials that people see on automobile accidents. I, uh, I would think that the Vietnam Veterans Memorial may have been, um, sadly, the inspiration for those roadside memorials. Now, we have a number of memorials around the country now. Um, you have the, the Oklahoma City Memorial, um, dedicated to the um, Americans and federal employees that were killed in Oklahoma City. You have the 9-11 Memorial. You have the Flight 93 Memorial. You have um, Columbine. All of these things have been um, have come after the creation of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, and I would think that uh, it's. I mean, I don't know how else to characterize it, but sadly, um, it would appear that the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is the progenitor of all those other memorials and the, the phenomena of leaving things. In the facility, there are approximately 400,000, maybe 450,000 objects. Some people leave things because others have, um, and they know, I mean, there are people that leave preconceived objects there knowing full well that the National Park Service is going to collect those objects. Um, and then there are people that have spontaneous or cathartic moments when they're there, and they feel the need to leave something. So you have the big and the small and the in-between. I think, to me, um, the most emotional are maybe the letters, um, from mothers to sons and fathers to sons and sons to brothers and children to fathers and to grandfathers. Um, so they're very emotional, very cathartic, and um, um, it's hard not to miss the meaning and things like that. It's. Um, to me, it's a, it's a living, it's, it's the most remarkable living, breathing museum collections in the national park system. It may be the most dynamic museum collection in the, in, in the museum world right now. It's a living, breathing, dynamic thing. It changes every day, and we are the lucky re people responsible for it. And um, I'm responsible for at least 40 or 50 other museum collections, but this is the one that sort of, that grabs people's attention. So many veterans were afraid that the memorial was going to be kind of an apology. Uh, and they, there was a lot of opposition. And I understood that. And I felt strongly. Uh, I didn't want to go there and see an apology. And fortunately, that's not what you see. You see a memorial uh, of great humanity uh, that, is, that honors the young men and women who were part of that war. Whatever you think of the war, uh, they deserve uh, to be honored by their country, and this memorial does honor them. 
That memorial in Washington is about people to me. My officer candidate roommate, Bobby Williams, is on it. Whenever I talk about the war, I do talks to classes and that sort of stuff. And I always start off with the etching from his, um, his place on the wall. Actually, he was, uh, he lasted 30 days in country and was shot in the Oshawa Valley. Um, he uh, is buried in the black section of the cemetery at Lawton, Oklahoma. And there's not even any veterans marker on his grave. I've tried to find his family to see about getting a veterans marker, but for some reason or other, his mother didn't want one. And so there is none. And also I really detest the fact that he is, you know, that there's this black and white section of that cemetery. But the, uh, the monument in Washington gives him equality. I believe actually the, the actual granite itself, the, the polished granite, allows you to see your own reflection in there. And I think that makes things kind of real to you. You look at these names and you say, look, I'm whatever, I'm 20 years old and half of the people on this wall are 20 years old. So. Uh, it has a big effect. I think the chronological nature of the, the name is a really big deal too. And the way it was designed, when, as you slowly walk down to it, and when it's finally kind of over your head, that's when you become very much immersed. A lot of people look to the wall as sort of a sacred place because it's, it's where they can connect with their fallen comrades. They can say goodbye to that friend they never had a chance to say goodbye to. Uh, a family member can go there and, and remember that loved one in a special way. And this continues to, to happen in, over and over again, and year after year. And it's, it's just amazing. It's a, if people can find a relationship to the memorial, then the list of names has a power that is inescapable. If it's their reflection, if it's their own name, if it happens to be the, the images of the human forms that are in the statue. All of those small and big things that saw it through to completion, with it being as faithful to the concept and the idea as possible, still amazes me that that could happen. This memorial reaches people where they least expect it. One of the names of the wall is is the wall that heals. I think that's something that Jan Scruggs created when he began to see some of the writings that people would send to him or, or to the memorial. I think that people should be remembered. I'm not sure that you should glorify specific wars and specific events, but I do think that people should be remembered. People who went to war for their country and died because of that war. They need to be memorialized. They need to be remembered. And it's the names that are important. It's not, you know, the statues and the flag raising and, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's the names.